Hello, this is King Rex coming at you with a video on the presidential tier list. I'm giving my own rankings in the tier lists. Um, I've seen some of these recently. I know it's something that was bigger a year or two ago. Um, I have six categories so I'm going to be ranking them in. Um, the first category, great, is reserved for four presidents that really were above and beyond all the others, and then the other categories kind of go down as they go. Um, so without further ado, I'll start ranking. The first president was Washington. Um, I put him in the great category. Without Washington, I don't believe that the Constitution would have worked. And the founding of the nation and the starting of the government under the Constitution was a very fragile time. I think the, that it was, he was so successful that people don't understand how fragile the new nation was. The second president was John Adams. I actually put him in the below average. I'm only ranking these guys based on what they did as president. And as president, Adams wasn't really that great. Um, he was a really good founding father, but the main things his presidency were known for was, one was the Alien and Sedition Acts, whereas the Alien Acts weren't that bad. They were just immigration restrictions. The Sedition Act basically made it illegal to um, protest or write anything against the government, which goes against the Bill of Rights. He also started the Quasi-War France, which was a naval war and almost got into a full-blown war. He's generally given great credit for not going to war with France, but his actions were what made war possible, and he was kind of lucky that we didn't go to war with France. Next president after him was Thomas Jefferson. I put him in the above average category. Now, he did do some things that were great, but he also did some things that weren't so great, and that's why he gets put in this above average category. The Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark Expeditions and the... Um, Barbary Pirate Wars were both all three great things. Most people don't learn about the Barbary Pirate Wars. Basically, the countries that were in Northern Africa were basically run by pirates, and they would attack other countries and make them pay tributes, and Jefferson went against that and fought a war against them. He fought the first Barbary Pirate War, the second war was under Madison, and it pretty much put an end to that piracy in that section of the world. But his negatives are the Embargo Act, which... It's probably one of the dumbest laws that was ever passed. Basically, the law was that we couldn't, he made it so we couldn't trade with any countries because Britain and France was attacking our ships on the high seas. And he tried to impeach um, judges because he didn't like them on purely political reasons, which it's thankful that he failed in that because everyone would try to do that sort of thing moving forward. And he kind of went cheap on the Navy and built a bunch of little small ships, which were good in the Barbary Pirate Wars. But when we got into a real war with Britain, they kind of got outclassed on the high seas. So he kind of, if it wasn't for those bad things, he probably would actually be a great president. But he knocks himself down to the above average. I still think that the good he did far outweighs the bad, but not enough to get him above the above average. The next president that served was James Madison. Put him in the near great category. Um... A lot of people try to rank him negatively for the War of 1812, but if he hadn't fought that war, Britain and France would have continued to just pick at the United States all the time. It's kind of like when you have someone bullying you, you actually have to stand up to them eventually. Plus, if you look at that war as an ends to a means, Britain was um, seizing our ships and impressing sailors on the high seas, and Britain stopped seizing our ships until right before World War I when Wilson was president. Um, because of that, so he stopped that. And he also stopped Britain from arming and inciting um, Indian rebellions in the West, which the West at that time is what's today, the Midwest mostly. Um, so the outcome, he got what he wanted out of the outcome of the war. So even though the war itself was kind of like a draw and we did lose some battles, um, I think people overly focus on that. I mean, when we were fighting Britain, we were fighting a country that was stronger than us. Whereas if you look at the wars that come after that, the Mexican-American War was completely in Mexico, and I don't even think there was even any battles in Texas. Um, the Confederacy was never really strong enough to actually go in and take on the Union. They could play a defensive war, but offensively, they only fought a few battles outside of the Confederate States. And most of those were in like Missouri, West Virginia, and Kentucky, they were minor battles, and those states were kind of half in, half out. Spanish-American War was completely in Cuba and the Philippines, so we really didn't fight any wars on our 
actual United States soil until the Pearl Harbor, which I think Pearl Harbor getting bombed the way it was was worse than Britain sacked in Washington just because we were totally unprepared and with the entire world at war, we should have been prepared for the possibility of getting into a battle. So I still put him near great because of the War of 1812. I think he did what was right. His second Barbary Pirates War was actually what ended the Barbary Pirates. And he was willing to admit when he was wrong, which a lot of people aren't, when he rechartered the uh, Bank of the United States of America, creating the second Bank of the United States of America because he was completely opposed to it. But when he became president and seen that it was needed, he actually did what was right and rechartered the bank. Next president is... Um, James Monroe, he's kind of borderline between near great and above average, but I'll put him in the near great. I know it's looking kind of top heavy here, but these presidents actually were pretty good, these first five for the most part. Um, the Air of Good Feeling, which he presided over, although a lot of that was due to Madison. Um, the only real mark against him, I guess you could say, would be the Missouri Compromise, because it did actually kind of split on sectional lines, but the states were already going that way. Most of the states south of that line, most of the territory south of Missouri already had states in it. And it did restrict slavery in the north of Missouri, except in Missouri, so it was actually good in that manner. Um, but he did a lot of other good things like the Monroe Doctrine. Um, a lot of the one thing that you can actually praise um, Andrew Jackson for was paying down the debt all the way, although there was a little bit of debt left when he left office. That paying down of the debt really started under Monroe, carried through John Quincy Adams and into Andrew Jackson's term. So I put him near great. Uh, the next one's one I'm really conflicted on because he is my line between average and below average, and that's John Quincy Adams. Um, he wasn't bad, but he wasn't good. He really didn't do a lot. He proposed a whole bunch of things. But because he was unwilling to remove people that were working directly against him in the federal government, um, he kind of let these people undermine his whole presidency. So not a whole lot was done during his term. So I think the fact that he was a really bad administrator kind of just bumps him in that below average. But anybody above him would be average or better. Anyone below him would be below average or better. But I'm going to put him in the below average category for that. Um, the next one is my first failure, Andrew Jackson. Um, He's really one of the most misunderstood presidents, I think, that there is out there. Um, a lot of people give him praise for the nullification crisis. Basically what it was is South Carolina said that the tariff laws were null and void and they didn't have to follow them. Um, the first thing Andrew Jackson did was lower the tariffs. Then when they said, well, the new tariff isn't low enough, we're not going to pay that either. He lowered the tariffs again, but when he lowered them the second time, he passed the force bill telling them if they didn't follow the new tariff law, which is basically what it was, before the what they called the Tariff of, Abom of Abominations was passed in 1832 or 1828, whatever is at the end of 1828, that he would go in and force them with the military. And people say, well, he forced them to back down. But the problem with that is that it's kind of like if you have a little kid with you in the grocery store and they're crying and wanting for him to buy him a candy bar the entire time in the store, and then you buy him the candy bar when you're at the checkout counter, and you tell him they better behave now. Well, you didn't teach them not to cry and whine and throw a fit. He taught them that if they do those things, in the end, they're going to get what they want, which is what South Carolina got. So he fostered future rebellion with that. His Indian, Indian policies would be termed as um, ethnic cleansing today, or where he pushed all the Indians out of west of the Mississippi and the entire country, pretty much. I mean, I won't call it genocide, but it was ethnic cleansing, and they really didn't take the time to properly prepare for the move to Oklahoma. They also they didn't just move them to Oklahoma, which most people think. They also moved them to Kansas and Nebraska. They just pushed them west, far west of the Mississippi, west of Missouri is what they did. So they didn't have them prepared properly, so a lot of them died. He also, um, which was against the Constitution, he disobeyed the orders of the Supreme Court when they said that he couldn't forcibly remove them. He destroyed the Second Bank of the United States of America and he did that against the uh, Constitution because he illegally withdrew the deposits within the bank because they had to be kept there, I think, until 1836, but he removed them in 1832. Um, he also allowed his uh, 
attorney general to illegally destroy um, what were called anti-slavery mailings. Basically, people in the North would send what was like a small newspaper to people in the South just to try to convince them that slavery was bad and they should get rid of slavery. Well, Jackson was very pro-slavery. In fact, he made his fortune being pro-slavery. He was the first pro-slavery president. The ones before him, they put up with it as part of the Constitution, but Jackson was truly pro-slavery. It should be noted that the first country to outlaw slavery in the entire world was Haiti, and they did it in 1804, and that was only because there was a slave revolt and the slaves took over, so it was the former slaves that ran the country, so of course they're going to outlaw it. So Jackson was very pro-slavery. He did a lot of bad things. Um, the only good thing he did really, you could say, was the debt, paying it down, but by the time he left office, it actually started building up again. He also crashed the economy, causing the Panic of 1837, what was called his, um, he did what was called a specky circular, which made, made that you couldn't buy property without gold, so you couldn't use banknotes, but the reason why there's all these banknotes causing inflation is because he destroyed the um, Second Bank of the United States of America, which had, which in its charter there were things to keep inflation in check, and he just put all the money into various pet banks that supported him, for political reasons. So he really was just terrible. There's really not a president in these first seven that's even comparable to as bad as Jackson is. Um, also in the failure category, I'm going to put um, Martin Van Buren. He pretty much was Jackson light. He carried out all of Jackson's policies, no matter how bad they were. The only thing he did differently was he eventually got rid of the pet banks and replaced them with the independent treasury. But the independent treasury created a credit crunch, which made the Panic of 1837 even worse. Um, but all of Jackson's terrible Indian policies, policies towards African Americans, the rest of his bad um, policies in the economy, he kept all that stuff going. He also was a president that, rather than solve the problems that came to him, he just kind of kicked the can down the road for the next guy. Um, which we're going to get to, we're not going to do William Henry Harrison because... He only served a month, so I'm not going to rank him. He's unrankable, which I should have had a category, but I didn't put it in. I forgot to. So the next president we're going to do is John Tyler. Um, when the Carolina Affair was a, basically people in the northern and upstate New York were trying to help people in Canada rebel against Great Britain. And when some of these people kind of were caught within U.S. waters, the ship, the Carolina, was caught on fire and sent over to Niagara Falls in a... U.S. citizen was killed by the British. Um, Van Buren didn't really do anything. He just kind of sent um, Winfield Scott, who was a lead general in the army up there, but he had no troops to send with him because he's fighting the Seminole, the Second Seminole War, which was totally pointless, which started under Jackson down in Florida. And then we also had something called the Aroostook War, which was another border dispute with um, Maine. Same thing. They disputed the what part was Maine and what part was New Brunswick. I mean, he basically just put things off until the next guy. He did the same thing with the Texas question. And John Tyler actually did all this. I don't know why I put Tyler in failure. He's not a failure. Tyler goes in there great. I pulled him up. I wasn't thinking. Tyler solved all those issues. Tyler's usually put in the failure category. But I believe this is because most people just don't know anything about him. He solved all the ongoing issues left over from of Van Buren. He got the economy back on track when he got rid of the independent treasury and raised the tariffs back up to where they would actually protect industry and keep jobs for Americans within the United States. Um, he ended the Seminole War just by simply ending it. He quit fighting. He pulled the troops out and let the Seminoles have what was theirs in the Everglades. So Tyler's a really good president. He also signed a treaty with China for trade, which is one of the first uh, trade treaties, treaties China actually signed. And um, he also said that, I believe he's was the, pre there's two presidents that dealt with Hawaii at this time, him and Fillmore. One said that it was covered by the Monroe Doctrine, and the other one kept the French from taking it over. I believe Tyler's the one that's, he'd be either way, like they said, hands off to Europe. I think Tyler kept it from being taken over by France. Tyler, and plus he actually annexed Texas, which was good for the United States. Texas was inevitably going to become part of the United States because what Mexico did was invited a whole bunch of people from the United States to settle this territory that was 
basically empty. And then when they settled it, they started trying to make laws that were against what the people in the area were doing. So they, Texas eventually rebelled. So Tyler deserves to be in the near crate category. Our next president is Polk. He's going to be my first average president. Um, he's kind of a good and bad guy. He kind of, you kind of have to balance him off of himself. He, all, he gets far too much credit. Um, he didn't have, like, one thing people say is he had everything he set out to do as president, he got done. This is completely false. Um, the myth of the four great measures that he wanted to do was done, but it was um, never heard of until years and years and decades after he was president. Um, his Secretary of Navy said that um, Polk came to him, said he had four great measures, and he completed them all. He said it's like in the 1880s to some historian when Polk was president in the 1840s. So nobody ever heard of this for like four decades, and then this guy come along and said this is what he did. Um, the four measures were to get California from Mexico, which he did, but he did by attacking, basically provoking a war with Mexico um, to get all of Oregon Territory, which he did not do. He only got about half of it because Oregon Territory actually was went all the way up to Alaska and British Columbia. Um, so to have a reduced tariff, which most presidents that served a full term before World War II actually did have tariff law changes within their term. So that's just something that's normal. And to um, put the independent treasury back in place that had been taken out by Tyler. Um, so he, even those four measures, he didn't even do all of them. In Mexico, he basically sent troops into the disputed area of Texas. And then when that didn't work, he had the troops blockade the Rio Grande River, which was an act of war. And eventually Mexico attacked and we won the Mexican-American War. And during his prosecution of the war, when John, when um, Zachary Taylor was becoming too big of a war hero, he pulled the troops from him and gave them to Winfield Scott to finish off the campaign. So he took political considerations into that. Um, also, he pro almost provoked the war with Great Britain at the same time. And if we'd have been fighting Great Britain and Mexico together, we might have lost both wars. But Great Britain actually agreed to what was proposed by Edward Everett, who was um, the last Secretary of State under John Tyler. Or no, he's a British minister under John Tyler, he's Secretary of State later. Um, he proposed basically taking the 49th parallel from where it ended at the Continental Divide, which is right around Idaho, the border of Idaho and um, Montana, extending it out to, I think it's called Pugo Sound, which is basically the border that it is, and let um, Britain have all of Vancouver Island, which falls partially below the um, 49th parallel, and let them have free passage to the sound. That's what they agreed to. It would have been agreed to if, but basically they, we ran out of time with John Tyler. So, but that was not what Polk said he was going to do. Polk said he was going to take all that territory, plus Vancouver Island, plus all of British Columbia. So he got like maybe half. And the um, territory was actually originally, our claims to it were made by Washington and Jefferson. So he shouldn't even get credit for that. He just negotiated the border. So he didn't bring that territory in. And one thing that people always forget about him when talking about the four great measures is the fact that he tried to get Cuba too and he failed there. So he didn't have just the four things he tried to do as president. Next president is um, Zachary Taylor. He goes into the average category as well. Um, he actually was like Lincoln in most of his, uh, most of what he wanted to do. Even though he owned slaves, he was against extending slavery at all, um, whereas the Wilmot Proviso, which said no slavery in the new territory from uh, Mexico, he favored that. He favored making California a state immediately, so it wouldn't be slavery. He also favored making, so there'd be no slavery there. He also favored making what was called the New Mexico Territory, which was most of the states of New Mexico and Arizona into an immediate state because there were no slaves there, so of course it would have been no slavery there either. 
So he wanted to stop the extension of slavery. He had a plan of the Civil War started when he was president to use blockades just to kind of stop the South from seceding. So he could have been Lincoln, except he died of, most people say gastroenteritis from eating bad cherries and sour milk on 4th of July. Um, some people think he died of cholera. There's a, Some people thought he might have been poisoned. They did test on his body and couldn't find it. He was poisoned, but they did them 140 years after he died. So who knows if the poison would have broke down by then if he was poisoned. But him dying did change um, what happened because he was against the uh, compromise of 1850. But as vice president, Miller Fillmore, who I put in the above average category, was actually in favor of it. Uh, basically, a lot of people go after him because one of the five parts of that compromise was the Fugitive Slave Act, which the Fugitive Slave Act, it's not like there was no Fugitive Slave Laws before that was passed. Um, there was a Fugitive Slave Laws. In fact, the Constitution specified that states had to return slaves to the states where they escaped from. But what happened was a lot of, state, a lot of the New England states we're just not following the law. Um, this is one of the states' rights things that the people from the South that seceded from the Union for states' rights, they didn't favor states' rights when it was the right to not return slaves. They favored them when it was the right to keep slaves. Um, that was part of the compromise, but it also outlawed um, the sale of slaves in the District of Columbia. It um, made California a free state with no slavery. It took part of the territory that Texas claimed and gave it to New Mexico while paying Texas' debts. Um, and it let the states, the areas that were brought in, which were Utah, which was all Mormon, so they were never going to vote for slavery, and the Arizona territory, Arizona, New Mexico area, to vote on slavery themselves when they become states, but that area was completely and totally unsuited to slavery. So the North wanted the Compromise of 1850, but a lot of people try to look at that. But once the issue of extension of slavery was settled under the compromise, the only thing abolitionists could really seize on was the fugitive slave law. Until after till the um, Kansas Nebraska Act, which we'll get to in the next president. Um, but Fillmore did do twice because Texas was originally going to try to secede back from the Union because it didn't like the fact that some territory was get, being given to New Mexico territory. <clears throat> the part of New Mexico that's east of the Rio Grande River, that's the area we're talking about. Well, Fillmore stopped them from seceding by sending troops and giving them a mess, third message is like, hey, you're not going to take this territory. They're going to try to attack that territory and re-secede. And also the Carolinas were going to secede from the Union because of the compromise, and he sent like additional troops there and stuff that he headed off a secession attempt by the Carolinas. He doesn't get any credit for this, but he basically does what, does the things that James Buchanan is vilified for not doing. You know, James Buchanan's rated a failure because he didn't do what Fillmore did, but then they rate Fillmore as a failure as well. These two presidents should not be rated the same. I put Fillmore in the above average category. Um, a lot of people put him lower because they don't like the fact that he ran with what was called the American Party, which was a nativist party before the Civil War, but they nominated him as their candidate when he was out of the country without consulting him. Then the Whig Party, which he was from, what was left of it, nominated him as well. So he just took the nomination and ran as a union candidate of holding the union together. He felt that if a Republican won the presidency, it would cause a civil war. And he was kind of right because as soon as Lincoln was elected, civil war broke out. Franklin Pierce, this is a guy I do feel kind of bad for. Um, he kind of belongs right in the middle of these two categories. But I'm going to put him in the below average. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. He did sign one of the worst laws ever, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which reorganized the political parties along sectional lines, the Republicans in the North that were against the extension of slavery, and the pro-slavery Southern Democrat Party, which the Democratic Party was basically pro-slavery from the day Andrew Jackson created it, but it got even more pro-slavery after this act. Um, he did pay down the debt a lot. He did have a good economy when he was president. Um, he did seek to, he did get what was called the Gadsden Purchase, which is the bottom part of New Mexico and Arizona. 
He sought to get Spain for Spain to sell us Cuba, which would have been good for the country because we've had tons of trouble with Cuba since then, but it fell through. Um, he's really borderline failure, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here and put him into the below average. But he's like my bottom below average president. Next guy is Buchanan. He gets to failure. Um, even if states hadn't started seceding from the Union at the end of his term in office, he was still a terrible president. The economy was awful underneath him, and he did things that made it worse. Um, he said he couldn't do anything to stop seceding states when they were leaving the Union, but he said he, but he went against um, the Mormons in Utah with very little evidence to stop what he thought was a rebellion there, so he's kind of two-faced. The worst thing he did, though, was when he, what he did was, when there's a case called the Dred Scott case, um, he said that no matter what, he would follow that case when it was handed down and everyone else should, which was a Supreme Court case, which would have been fine, except he went to Supreme Court justices, influenced their decisions, and got them to rule in the manner that he wanted to, and they told him to make a broad ruling, which basically the Fred Scott case said that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional, that the federal government could not stop um, people from bringing slaves to different territories because the Dred Scott case was that a slave was brought to a free territory in Wisconsin and not freed. He said the African Americans, whether they were slaves or not, were not U.S. citizens, therefore they couldn't even petition the court. And a bunch of other bad things it was Roger Taney who made the um, decision and he was put as this Chief Justice under Andrew Jackson. He had another bad thing Andrew Jackson did. Um, plus, his Secretary of War started sending materials down to the South right before the Civil War, and then he pulled troops away from those forts so the South could easily take over any supplies, and the guy ended up joining the uh, Confederate Army. So he allowed the South to grow strong in the intermediate period from when they seceded from the Union in December until Lincoln became president in March. He could have done something. I mean, he's kind of in a bad situation there, but even if he hadn't done that, he was so bad otherwise, like during the Kansas-Nebraska fiasco in Bleeding Kansas, he um, supported the pro-slavery uh, constitutions for Kansas, even though he knew they were ill-gotten. So he's just terrible. Um, Lincoln, I put to the great, he's my second great president. Um, he preserved the Union, and a lot of people have some issues with him, but if Lincoln hadn't preserved the Union, would the United States be the country it is today? Because if those states were allowed to leave, then the next time a state had a dispute with the federal government, they would leave. The United States wouldn't be one big country. It would be maybe 50 countries. Who knows if it would be even more than that because there's areas within states that want to leave their states. Um, without the United States, there's no counterbalance to Nazi Germany because we really, if we don't help during World War II, um, Germany probably wins and there's no counterbalance to um communist Soviet Union. So you got to look at that far-reaching thing that he did. Um, the United States, I believe, is the greatest country in the world, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that Lincoln held it together. If Lincoln had it held together, we may have 50 different countries right now. After Lincoln, you have Andrew Johnson, who basically is a failure. He used to be ranked as an average to below average president by most historians, um, but he's a failure. Um, basically, when the South came back into the Union, he basically said, that, basically said, okay, we're, you're all good now. And um, the South made, basically re-elected all the Confederate leaders to Congress. And they passed what were called Black Codes, which were basically laws that pretty much relegated the former slaves to basically being a slave class. And the Ku Klux Klan sprung up into being. All this happened before Congress even convened. And he basically, his defiance of Reconstruction helped lead to the um, Jim Crow laws and a, a century of the mistreatment of African Americans in this country. Um, for that reason, he belongs in the failure category, even though if you look at his presidency outside of that, like his foreign policy was really good. He got Alaska from Russia cheap, and he helped with the removal of Maximilian as basically an installed dictator from a European country in Mexico, but otherwise he was awful. He also like vetoed every bill that came down the pipe 
because he said it was illegal for Congress to pass, pass bills unless former Confederates were readmitted into Congress. So he was just an out there nutball. Grant, this is a president I put in the near great category. Um, the story just started giving Grant respect. They used to not give him any respect at all. Um, he, with Reconstruction, broke the backs of the Klan, which didn't come back until um, 1915 under Woodrow Wilson. Um, he, his economic programs basically made for the success, the pre-World War I success of the country economically. He vetoed a very popular bill, it's called the Inflation Bill, which would have added a bunch of um, what were called greenbacks into the uh, money supply, which is money that wasn't backed by gold or silver, which would have led to inflation. If you look at the rampant inflation in Germany between the two world wars, he stopped that type of inflation from happening. So he's a good, very good economic president. He tried to be kinder to Native Americans than any president before him, although he did have kind of a paternalistic view of them where he wanted just to assimilate them into American culture. But that's far better than trying to just jam them all into reservations or eliminate them all together. Um, the corruption was far overblown under Grant. Basically, the spoil system was created by Andrew Jackson. And by the way, it was created, basically jobs were given to people because they were political friends. And then they were expected to make political contributions to the party. Well, because of this, there's a lot of corruption in the government. And when Grant was president, he sought out that corruption, like, and he gets blamed for like the credit mobilier scandal, which was completely in Congress. Gets blamed for the tweed ring, which was completely in New York politics. There's like one U.S. congressman elected out of that. He gets blamed for the gold ring, which Elliot Fiscal and Jay Gould tried to um, corner the gold market, and Grant stopped them from doing that. Um, so Grant should actually get credit for trying to root out corruption, but he gets, but because a lot of historians didn't like him, they took the. Uh, lost cause, um, pro-Confederate view of history where they say that the Confederates didn't fight over slavery at all, which we all know slavery was the main issue, that it was just states' rights and Grant was basically destroyed because of that because he defeated the Confederacy. That's strike one. He tried to protect the rights of uh, former freed slaves. And that's strike two against him. And strike three, he was a Republican. And most people take that pro-Confederate you know, lost cause thing, they were Democrats. So he gets ranked poorly when he shouldn't be. Like Tyler, these two guys should be ranked toward the top, they're generally ranked toward the bottom. Next president is Hayes. I put him in the average category. Um, the only knock I have against Hayes is that he did end Reconstruction, but he really had little choice in the matter. Democrats took control of the House and they weren't going to give any money for it. Um, they appropriated the funding for the Army, they weren't going to fund the Army with soldiers still encamped in the state houses in a few last few southern states that they were. One great thing he did do is that they tried to put um, riders, which were basically secondary laws attached to appropriation bills that would have um, repealed the enforcement acts that were passed under grant to stop um, basically the domestic terrorism that the KKK did against former slaves. And he vetoed like four or five times he vetoed these bills to stop them. He also stopped the Chinese Exclusion Act from being passed during his term in office. Um, and he was a, a good sound money man, so he was a good economic president. So I put him in the average, although you could make an argument that he belongs in the above average. He's kind of like Grant in his um, Indian policy as well. But he was, he was paternalistic, but at least he wasn't just trying to wipe them out. Um, next president, Garfield's not getting rated. He only served six months. Um, next one's Arthur. I put him right there with Hayes. Arthur, um, he, basically he was a spoils man. He was never elected any political office until he was elected vice president because people didn't pay attention to who they were elected vice president at the time at all. In fact, most vice presidents that became president were put on the ticket to either balance the ticket out in some manner or to make a portion of the party happy. That's why Tyler was put there. That's why Johnson was put there. And that's why... Um, Arthur was put there, but Arthur passed civil service reform, which is generally people don't look at it as big as they should be, but the way it was working, it was an end to the spoil system, 
And because both parties got a lot of power from the spoil system, the people that benefited from it the most were the people that had to get rid of it. Like the Congress benefited the most from the spoil system because they would ask congressmen who they wanted put in different positions, even sometimes from the opp opposition party. So it's called um, congressional consent or something like that, or consideration or cur congressional courtesy is what they called it. He put an end to that. Um, he did sign a Chinese Exclusion Act, but he vetoed the first one. It would have been a 20-year ban and got it brought down to a 10-year ban. If he'd vetoed that, it would have passed over his veto because it was so old. It was a veto-proof. Like, they passed it with a veto-proof majority, so he didn't fight it. But he did get a better law than what was originally offered. That's, the, like, the one knock against him. Um, he's a pretty decent eco economic president. Um, he lowered tariffs slightly. Um... He was a very good president, I think. I just think that he's another one that gets ranked lower than he should. Grover Cleveland, I'm going to put him in the below average. He's one that historians used to love a lot for some reason. Um, my main things with him is that basically when it comes to the policy towards African Americans, he was lockstep with Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson gets hit a little harder because Andrew Johnson actually pretty much pioneered that policy. Cleveland just followed it. Uh, Cleveland also broke up the Pullman strike in favor of the country of the um, company that was exploiting its workers. He shouldn't have broke the strike. He should have sent the troops in to protect property and stop riots, but he shouldn't have broke the strike. He was a terrible economic president. He vetoed pension bills because he didn't feel that um, people who served in the Civil War should have got pensions. There was a bill called the Dependent. Basically, there's tons and tons of pensions bills that would be passed through, but there's one bill that would have given him a, a reasonably modest pension, which would be like, in today's money, around $300 a month. That's nothing big. He vetoed that. Um, he was against, he passed what was called the Dawes Plan, which took away two-thirds of all land from Native Americans. He was just really a bad human rights president. Honestly, I'm kind of giving him a benefit of the doubt to put him below average. To me, the failures are ones that were just absolutely terrible. They were just so bad that they really were detrimental to the country. Cleveland was just bad. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, I put up in the above average category. Um, he's a president that generally gets ranked low, but the funny thing is, is that what he did should rank him high. The main thing that they go after him for is to say that he was this big wasteful spender and all this and that. But he was the last president to run a net surplus during his term until um, Warren Harding and Harding and Coolidge did it, and then no other president has since. So he wasn't this huge spender. And Grover Cleveland is generally known as a guy that was, you know, good with money and wasn't wasteful. Under Grover Cleveland, they ran a net deficit under his term. Um, he rebuilt the Navy. I mean, Arthur's kind of started towards that way, but he rebuilt the Navy, which we needed during the Spanish American War. He passed the Sherman. Um, Antitrust Act. He passed um, some forestry acts that allowed for the making of national forests more easily. Um, all in all, he's a pretty good president. He's kind of like a guy that's just not remembered. He, the biggest issue he has that historians look at, which is, doesn't shouldn't really matter in rankings, is he had a very cool personality one on one, and he got married to a younger woman after his wife died. But if you're going to count it against him for marrying a younger lady, she counted against Grover Cleveland because he did the same thing. Um, they counted against Tim and Tyler, but not against Grover Cleveland. I don't know why. Um, which that doesn't even matter when you're ranking presidents because that's personal life. And it was two willing participants want to get married. I don't see why anyone should even get mad about it. Um, the next one's McKinley. But McKinley in the near great category. He, um, for once and all, settled the gold silver issue, which put the um, gun on the gold standard which made the economy better. He was basically he fixed the terrible economy Cleveland left him. He fixed the tariff laws. He got next to Hawaii. He won the Spanish-American War. Um, he's generally, a lot of people that really are in the know consider him the first modern president. Some people say Roosevelt. He wasn't as flamboyant as Roosevelt, but he really was... A really good president. Um, unfortunately, he died after a little over four years in office. But well, he was a really good, solid president. I mean, he, to me, he was the best one, like you see here at Grant. 
Then we have Teddy Roosevelt. He's a very beloved president, but as a president, he was below average. The thing with Teddy Roosevelt, he was kind of like he does Eckes commercials. He was the most interesting man in the world, but most of what he did was unconstitutional. He had the belief in him that if he felt something was for the greater good, he could do it without, you know, he could go around the Constitution to do it without congressional approval. Which even if you agree with what he was doing, that's still a dangerous precedent to set. He also liked to invade countries from Central and South America and the Caribbean. His reasoning was that he jumped in there and took them over before someone else would, um, which he shouldn't have been doing such things. He basically tarnished the country's image when he took um, when he helped Panama gain independence. He did it over the matter of a few million dollars, basically. Columbia wanted $25 million for the lease rights. Panama sold it much cheaper when he became a nation. Um, Taft was his underling. Taft was basically Roosevelt light. Taft was to Roosevelt. Let's see if I got him right here. We'll put Taft up one level above Roosevelt. He was to Roosevelt what Buchanan was, I mean, Van Buren was to Jackson. The difference with Taft was he was a constitutional president and he wasn't a big self promoter the way Roosevelt was. So you get the most of the good stuff from Roosevelt with Taft. There's still some bad, like it's his dollar diplomacy wasn't a good foreign policy. Was definitely better than the whole cowboy just go in there and take him over the way that Roosevelt did. And he was constitutional, but he did still pass some dubious laws. And he did give us the thing that keeps him from being hired. He had come to actually favor that, and that was terrible. Wilson, to me, Wilson is a failure. Um, Wilson was damaging on a global level. Um, he basically got the United States sucked in the World War One, which we should have never been in. Um, the settlements of that, which he was in on the negotiation of the settlements, but even beyond that, he tipped the balance of power during the war so that the other countries could impose a very harsh uh, peace on Germany, which led to the rise of Hitler. Um, he paid off the Kerensky government to stay in the war against Germany, which led that government to collapse and be replaced by the Bolsheviks in Russia. Um, what was the Ottoman Empire at the time, which is now called Turkey, was a lot of that was divided into um, smaller countries and given us colonies to the British and French, which includes countries like Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, Egypt. Think of all the problems you have there. We'd be much better with a unified Turkey than that. Um, the creation of Yugoslavia, which is a bunch of headaches for us during the 90s. Uh, plus, he trashed the economy when he's president. He made the Federal Reserve, which causes, which I do believe there should be a federal banking system, but the way the Federal Reserve was made, it doesn't work properly, and it causes the business cycle. Um, if you actually look, you can see that. So he's just, not, plus he was a major racist. I try to say you got to look at presidents within the context of their times, but even within the context of his times, he was a massive racist. He imposed segregation in the federal government. He helped lead to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. He passed the Sedition Act and another one at the time, which basically jailed espionage and sedition acts, which basically jailed anyone who disagreed with him. Basically, he had political prisoners when he left office. He was terrible. To me, he's the worst president ever. There really isn't anything redeeming about Woodrow Wilson. Um, after Wilson, you have Harding, who generally these guys are ranked the exact opposite of the way I ranked them. Harding, I put them in their great category. Harding fixed the economy. He released Wilson's political prisoners. He got peace deals and um, demobilized after the war. Something Wilson didn't do with it. He had two years to do it. Um, there is some corruption under Harding, but it was smaller under Harding than it was under Wilson. The, um, the excuse the historians make is that, well, during times of war, there's so much money being spent, you just can't watch those types of things. That's a BS explanation. Um, there's two pieces of corruption under Harding. They try to make it to be more, but there's only two that are proven. The first was a guy named Charles Forbes, who was actually put who was actually put into his position by Wilson. He was Wilson's the one to put him in the government. He was basically stealing in the Veterans of, uh, Bureau. When Harding found out, he very harshly chastised him. 
it fired him, but people blame Harding because he was able to escape the country. But, I mean, I guess Harding could have had cops here arrest him, but he basically called him a bastard and put him up against the wall and asked him how he could do it. Um, so Harding actually got rid of him, and that wasn't a Wilson appointee anyway. Uh, the other one was Albert Fall, who was a, the Secretary of Interior. He basically took loans or bribes, however you want to look at it, to give out non-bid leases in what's called the Teapot Dome, which is for oil. Um, the only thing he did improperly was he didn't like have different companies bid on these leases, and he should have taken any money from the people that he gave the lease rights to. Um, the guy whose name was Sinclair stated that yes, Albert Fall was on his payroll, but four members of Wilson's cabinet was too. But once again, historians don't want to look at that. Uh, Fall was convicted. He was the only person convicted out of Harding's administration for corruption. Um, but the thing with Albert Fall was, is that people say, well, Harding shouldn't have known better, but Albert Fall was a senator. Harding was a senator before becoming president. He nominated him for Secretary of Interior. And every single senator in the Senate voted to confirm him. He was the first unanimously confirmed um, cabinet member ever. So he fooled everybody. He just didn't fool Harding. He got them all. So when you think, oh, Harding should have known better, well, then so should have the other, how many other senators there were, there were like 96 senators at the time, what about the other 94 guys? They didn't know better either. Uh, people try to make his um, Attorney General, Harry Doherty, out to be a criminal, but once again, there's no real proof, and the guy was tried and found innocent, so I don't count someone that's found innocent as being corrupt. Next guy is Calvin Coolidge. He was to Harding, kind of like Taft to Roosevelt. He was just Harding White. Um, no corruption in his term, but I kind of put him in the above average rather than the great uh, for two reasons. He didn't pioneer really anything that Harding did. He just kind of kept it going. And Harding came in, and the country was in a shambles from Wilson. The only thing that he had to worry about was the Teapot Dome scandal, which is overblown. I mean, do you really think the, there's no one in the government that's cheating now? I mean, come on. We know that there's all kinds of corruption in government. So he only gets an above average, although he's really close to the near grade. Hoover, I put below average. Um, he completely failed economically. His policies were bad, which if you look, Grover Cleveland's in the same category with him. Um, otherwise, though, if it wasn't for the economy, he was actually would have been a fairly good president. He had good foreign policy. He's probably one of the best administrators ever that was president. But his um, economic policies, which it wasn't all his fault for the Great Depression. Um, a lot of it has to do with the way the Federal Reserve acted, and the Federal Reserve didn't take, um, <coughs> didn't, the president didn't tell the Federal Reserve what to do, and they did it. They didn't take direction from the president until Woodrow, until um, Lyndon Johnson became president. So I put him in this below average category. Now we have FDR. This is one of the biggest mixed bag presidents ever. I put him in the average. He was, a, for the most part, a great wartime president, but there are two things that go against him as his wartime president goes. Number one, rather than going to the American people and making a case to go to war, he kind of looked for a backdoor in, and he agreed at Yalta to let the Soviet Union pretty much just take over Eastern Europe. But he did lead the United States to a hard-fought victory, even though he died before the end of the war. So he does get credit for being a great wartime president. Economically, he was the same as Hoover. He did not solve the Great Depression. He made it worse. And he actually has a fairly poor record when it comes to human rights. He, most of the New Deal legislation was written in such a manner that African Americans couldn't benefit from it. He was opposed to anti-lynching laws. Um, he imprisoned um, people of Japanese descent just because they were of Japanese descent. But Basically, if it hadn't been, if he'd have left office after eight years, I couldn't put him. I'd have to put him in below average or failure. But the war saves him. He basically stayed in there long enough that he could be successful. Our next one, Harry Truman. He goes right up here in there. Great. He's a borderline to great. Um, he ended the war with uh, Japan by dropping an atomic bomb. A lot of people are against that, but. The Japanese were looking to fight to the last man on every island. So if he doesn't end the war with Japan, that way it probably goes on for another few more years. Millions of people die on both sides. So yeah, the atomic bomb was terrible, but it ended the war 
with a lot less bloodshed, even to um, citizens, because the Japanese were training their citizens to fight. He, um, the only thing, he did a great job in Europe as a foreign policy president. He did a very good job in the United States, domestic policy. His only negatives really were that he should have helped Chiang Kai-shek when he didn't during the Chinese Revolution, which led to communists taking over. And he basically, it's kind of his fault that the Korean War started and he didn't have a, um, he, when he had it won, he pushed for more. Because originally we were just supposed to expel the North Koreans from the South, but he tried to push and take the whole country. So, other than his policies within Asia, but he did have good policies to Japan, I'll give him that. He was a really good president. Next is Eisenhower. He's my third great president. Um, he's one that I think people don't know enough about. He's the president that was the closest to Washington. He didn't make any major mistakes. Um, you got to remember, he was the president when the Soviet Union really got nuclear capabilities. Um, a lot of people pushed him to go to nuclear war as a first strike to the Soviet Union. Um, and Vietnam and Korea over... Like there's like six times, um, China was messed was trying to go after Taiwan by taking over a few small islands that were between them that Taiwan had, which was Chiang Kai-shek, and he refused. And all of his generals got together and said, "No, we need to we need to use nukes to end these wars." So really, if Eisenhower had been anyone but Eisenhower, he probably wouldn't have been able to say no. So he probably saved civilization by not going to nuclear war and by making defense enough that he stopped there being in World War III basically with his um, massive retaliation, which means that we have all these nuclear weapons. So Russia never fought against us because they knew they would be destroyed in the process, which basically, they basically is like, if you go after us, you're going to be destroyed and we'll both be destroyed. So basically, it may sound like a crazy thing, but he kept... You know the peace. He never. He actually was smart enough not to go into Vietnam, but the people to follow him were. Kennedy. Kennedy is another one that's kind of hard. Um, I like him a lot, but I can't put him anywhere but average. <coughs> you have to balance out that he messed up in the Bay of Pigs, and he did bring the first combat troops to Vietnam, but he was in the process of pulling the combat troops out of Vietnam. Um, at the Vienna. In Berlin, he actually told the Soviet Union that, hey, you're not taking Berlin, we're going to defend it. Which did, people blame him for the building of the Berlin Wall, but the building of the Berlin Wall was the Soviet Union saying, okay, we're not going to be able to take West Berlin. So they had to basically wall West Berlin in so that people from Germany would not escape to West Berlin to avoid communism. It was actually, it shows you how bad communism was, that they actually had to wall the people in to keep them from leaving. Um, Cuban Missile Crisis, he deserves great credit for as well. Uh, basically, he's a mixed bag. A lot of these guys in this average category are kind of mixed, or even Jefferson up here. Jefferson, Roosevelt, Kennedy. Because there's like some good, some bad, and it kind of balances. Lyndon Johnson, below average, if it wasn't for his civil rights change, because he really was against civil rights when he first became when he's first in politics, he would be in a failure. Um, his Great Society was a complete and utter failure. The idea was to eradicate poverty. Poverty rates were rapidly dropping before he became president, and since he left, they just fluctuated. So the Great Society was a failure. His handling of Vietnam was a failure, but he saved from being a failure because he did go along with civil rights. Nixon is another one I put up here in the average category. Um... He's another really mixed bag. Watergate hurts him a lot. Um, foreign policy, he sought peace, even though he kind of went along with the Soviet Union being um, the Soviet Union coexisting with them, which Reagan showed that they needed to be completely destroyed. The fact that he eased tensions a little bit probably helped lead Reagan to change his negotiations with Gorbachev. He Recognized China as a country, which we didn't do before that. He got us out of Vietnam. He saved Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Um, he actually was the best president when it comes to Native Americans. He was 
He got the economy fixed for a little while, but because of the Yom Kippur War, you had the oil embargo, which destroyed the economy again. But the economy was messed up by Lyndon Johnson before that. Um, but Watergate hurts him, and his economic programs were good short-term, but not good long-term for the most part. But he's kind of had his hand forced because the country was just a mess after Lyndon Johnson was president. Next, we're going to Gerald Ford. He's another one of these average guys. He's kind of another Nixon light. He usually gets hit hard because he part of Nixon, but he did what was right for the country because the country needed to heal. So he should be given credit for doing what was politically wrong for him, but was right for the country. He actually got the economy turned around a little bit before Carter became president. And Carter destroyed the economy. Carter goes down here. Um, terrible economic record. He basically encouraged the pumping of inflation into the economy. His first Fed chair was um, put in under Ford. It was Arthur Burns, not under Nixon, Arthur Burns, who he kind of pushed out. Put in um, Miller, who pumped all kinds of inflation into the economy. Um, after his Malay speech, he fired like four cabinet members. One of them was a secretary of Treasury. He had to replace that guy. He couldn't find anyone in the private sector. So he made Miller the Secretary of Treasury, and when he couldn't find anyone to become the Fed chair, he was stuck with Volcker, but even encouraged Volcker not to, like, raise interest rates. So he was ruined the economy. Um, he come up with the idea of really bad laws that, like, basically put taxes on gasoline and stuff, which hurt the energy sector. Um, the gas guzzler tax, which only goes against cars, but not trucks and SUVs. So it's actually made people buy less fuel-efficient pickup trucks and SUVs and destroyed the full-size car and the full-size station wagon because of a basically unintended consequences of a bad tax. Um, the Iran, he basically he failed with the in Iran in several ways. He pushed the Shah out for the Ayatollah, then the Ayatollah took all the hostages, which hurt him. He funded. Um, Islamic fundamentalist groups in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Um, realistically, I'm really giving him a huge benefit of the doubt by putting him in below average because he really has all the hallmarks of a failure, let's be honest. Um, Reagan is my fourth near great, or my, I'm sorry, my fourth great president. He won the Cold War and he fixed the economy. And the economy was good, mostly good from 1983 when he finally got it fixed until the housing market crash of 2008. So he's got to be given a lot of credit there. Um, the presidents that followed him should be given some credit like Bush and Clinton because they kept going. But I put him in the great category for winning the Cold War and fixing the economy. Um, Bush, the elder, I put in the near great category. He was to Reagan, kind of, he's like Reagan light, kind of like Coolidge to Harding and Ford to Nixon. Um, he very skillfully presided over the end of the Cold War, um, had he been a different type of president. That would have been all celebrating and putting it in Russia's face. Things could have been worse. So I believe he deserves his um, categorization as a near great because of that. The economy did kind of go through a small recession underneath him, but he also passed a law that, that did have the tax increase just for the top tax bracket from 28% to 31%, which it's never been 31% since. But it had spending caps put in it that were like a 10-year spending caps, which ran all the way through Clinton's presidency, so that did help with the budget. Clinton I put in the average category. Now, the reason why he gets hurt down into the average category, he created a constitutional crisis when he decided to lie under oath. Even if you don't believe he should have been impeached, um, he could have simply not answered the question. Answered it honestly because it was after he was already reelected, so it couldn't hurt him at all to say that, yeah, he cheated on his wife. Everyone knew he did those things anyway. Um, or he could have simply settled the Paul Jones lawsuit not, and avoided the whole situation to begin with, which he settled it anyway. So, yeah, he gets the average. Because even though he did a good job on the economy and on the budget, that hurts him. Plus, his foreign policy was kind of eh. He intervened within the internal politics of the Sudan and former Yugoslavia when he should have just stayed out of those things. And he did make the bad nuclear deal with um, Korea. 
Uh, Bush Jr., I put in the average category. He's kind of like Clinton um, in and of the fact that he overspent, so he was bad, worse on the budget. The economy was – the economic crash in 2008 wasn't his fault. It was really the Community Reinvestment Act, which was put in by Jimmy Carter, um, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac messing around, buying up home loans and reselling them in the stock market. That combined with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates on the um, variable rate loans, which were created because the Community Reinvestment Act stated that, hey, if you don't give loans to people with – these people with bad credit and – low income were going to go after your bank, so they started giving, doing variable rate loans so they could get them into loans. And then you had more people that wanted to buy better, more expensive houses than they could actually afford, so they went for those variable rate loans. Then when the Fed started jacking interest rates up, the interest rates on all those variable rate loans went right with it, and they couldn't afford it. And it was kind of like a domino effect. And he did actually pass the TARP funding, which was loans to the banks that kept them from failing, which people kind of complain about, but the money was paid back with interest. That, to me, is a good thing. Um, I'm not going to rank the last two. Trump is still president right now. And Obama, you really don't have enough perspective. Um, my opinions have changed on Obama since he left office already. My opinions have changed on Clinton since he left office. A lot of historians' opinions change on presidents over time. So I'm not rating those four. Um, just as a, things, Eisenhower and Reagan both ranked far lower when they were first ranked. And their opinions have changed on those guys since then. Grants moved up, and the first rankings were done in the late 1940s. So, I mean, it was decades after he left office. So I'm not doing these four guys. Um, I want to thank you for um, watching, like, share, comment. Have a great day.